Good afternoon, everyone. Welcoming the webinar today. We are so pleased to have you for today's panel discussion about the Ebony Test Kitchen and hosted by Landmarks Illinois in our Snapshots lecture series. I just want to let you know we're going to take about a minute at this point to ensure that everybody can get in successfully to the webinar and solve any technical issues that people are having. So just bear with us. We're going to wait just about uh, 45 more seconds. And this is a good time just to remind you to ensure that you're in speaker view, for example, so that you can get the, the most of seeing our speaker, as well as the really incredible PowerPoint presentation that we have for you today. And of, of any display, you're gonna wanna see this wonderful PowerPoint of an incredible cultural and historic resource. So once again, welcome everyone. We're just gonna take a couple more seconds to ensure that everybody can get into the webinar. We want uh, to make sure that everyone can hear our speakers today and takes full advantage of this incredible preservation success story. So give us about 20 more seconds here. I just saw um, everyone that we had a question whether closed captioning is available. Uh, just to let you know what we have done in the past is that we post this to our YouTube page after the presentation is done and that is where you can put closed captioning on if you're watching it via YouTube. Uh, we apologize today we did not make uh, available a closed captioning or simultaneous translation uh, to my knowledge so but we certainly apologize. We're working on making that available for our lectures in the future, but please go back and go watch the YouTube channel when this is posted in the future. And again, you will be able to turn on the closed captioning um, and also language translation. So I think we should get started and let me give a very warm welcome, official welcome to everybody who's joining us for our uh, Landmarks Illinois Preservation Snapshots panel discussion today about the Ebony Test Kitchen. And we are thrilled this webinar has had one of the broadest reaches that we have seen. Uh, today, we're welcoming people from 11 states across the United States, as well as Canada. So welcome everyone. If this is your first time meeting us at Landmarks Illinois, let me introduce myself. I'm Bonnie McDonald. I'm the president and CEO of Landmarks Illinois, and I'm joined by many of my colleagues here from the Landmarks Illinois team. We are the statewide historic preservation organization in, in Illinois, the nonprofit organization. We are a 51-year-old organization that helps people save places for people. That's how we best describe our work. And we're proud to have worked side by side with thousands of people over our history to help support the preservation of over 24,000 historic places in Illinois. So we're proud to be the voice for preservation and the go-to resource in our state, including Chicago, but also all points all across Illinois. So it's nice to meet you if you haven't met us before. Now, our Director of Advocacy, Lisa DiChiera, will be leading today's exciting discussion, and she's going to be sharing the history, the significance, as well as the trajectory that you're going to hear about with the preservation of the Ebony Test Kitchen from its former home at the Johnson Publishing Company headquarters building here in Chicago to its disassembly in 2019 by Landmarks Illinois volunteers, as well as members of our Skyline Council headed by Christopher Inc. And uh, it follows its way all the way to the Museum of Food and Drink, otherwise known as MOFAD, you might hear their acronym, in New York City, where the kitchen is now the center place of the first major exhibit that celebrates African-American contributions to our nation's culinary identity. The exhibit, just to let you know, is called African American Making the Nation's Table, and it was opening today. Uh, so when you're in New York City, we hope that you will go and see this. The uh, exhibit runs from today through June 19th at the Africa Center, then Gote Hall, which is located in Manhattan. Now joining us for today's discussion, we're so excited to welcome our special guests, including Charlotte Draper and Jean Nihul. 
Sharla is a food professional who likes to say that she's stirred a few pots in her career, which I think is phenomenal, Sharla. Uh, she's worked for Fortune 500 corporations, including Kraft Foods, which is where she was before joining Ebony Magazine as a food editor. We'll hear more about her work in the Ebony Test Kitchen later in our program. Now, currently, Sharla is the owner of It's a Food Biz, which provides marketing services for food and food-related products. And she is also a writer focusing on food history and food-related topics. So I hope that you've seen her work, but you can look it up. Uh, her work includes cooking on 19th century whaling ships and contributions to the Chicago Food Encyclopedia, Cuisine Noir, and the Midwesterner magazines. In addition, Charlotte is the founder of National Soul Food Month, which we celebrate every June. So thank you so much for being here with us, Charlotte. We're looking forward to hearing from you and talking with you. Thank Jean you. Nihul joins us from New York, New York, and he is going to tell us about his role in bringing the Ebony Test Kitchen to MoFAD, where he formerly served as the culinary operations manager and curator, working with chefs and scholars to put together one-of-a-kind exhibitions. Jean has had various roles in the food industry and currently works for food equipment manufacturing company Booker & Dax. And he's also the host of a podcast, which I hope you'll check out, Cooking Issues. So welcome, Jean. And to our guest. Oh, sorry, Lisa's, Lisa's almost, we're almost ready for her. She's going to turn her microphone off. Um, but to our guests, uh, if you have questions today for Lisa, for Sharla, or for Jean, please add them to the chat or into the Q&A, and we'll be sure to address them at the end of the program. So we'll be monitoring that, and we'll put forward your questions at the end of the presentation. Now, I mentioned Landmarks Illinois Skyline Council, which is our dedicated group of emerging preservation professionals who must be credited for their swift action to save the test kitchen, which Lisa is going to tell you more about today. We just want to thank them for their incredible advocacy. Now, it's a group that is not afraid to get their hands dirty, and through the years, they have taken on some very challenging service projects, including the Ebony Test Kitchen. It's a social bunch, too, who like to combine fun with preservation advocacy. So you're going to see the Skyline Council here in a photo that was just taken over a week ago at their annual heart bombing event, which is an annual community activity project that raises awareness about buildings that are threatened with demolition. Now, this building that you see here is the former shop building at Alt Gelf Gardens, which is on Chicago's far south side. And it was listed on Landmarks Illinois' 2021 Most Endangered Historic Places list. And on February 12th, the Skyline Council partnered with People for Community Recovery and other organizations to show the building some love by papering it with Valentines. This year, we'll be celebrating the 10 year plus one anniversary of our Skyline Council, and we'll be having an event later this year to recognize this milestone. So I, I hope you'll join us to support our emerging professionals. And speaking of parties, Landmarks Illinois has a very big one that's coming up on March 10th at Chicago's old post office, which was recently rehabilitated and will be a magnificent backdrop for what we're calling our Preservation Forward event. This year, the event will honor the 2022 Landmarks Illinois Influencers, which is a group of seven all-women honorees who have shaped Illinois' built environment and who their work are joining Landmarks Illinois in its progressive effort to create a more diverse, equitable, just, inclusive, and accessible preservation movement. So this event is Landmarks Illinois' most important fundraiser of the year, and it actually raises 60% of the resources that we need for Lisa's work and her colleague, Quinn Adamowski, our advocacy team. So we would like to invite you to join us um, to support this kind of advocacy you're hearing about today, Saving the Ebony Test Kitchen and its important historic and cultural legacies. So please consider joining us for Preservation Forward. We're gonna put the link into the chat where you can go to our website at landmarks.org to learn more about our seven influencers and you can register for the event too. Now, I'm gonna turn the program over to Lisa DiChiara and she is gonna share the incredible journey of the Ebony Test Kitchen. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Bonnie. And welcome everyone. And we're happy to have you with us this afternoon. Just real briefly, we are going to give a, a brief history about the Ebony Test Kitchen and the building from where it came called the Johnson Publishing Company headquarters 
and the history of Ebony Magazine. The Johnson Publishing Company was founded in Chicago in 1942 and became one of the most important African-American companies, owned companies in the nation. Founded by John H. Johnson, the media company gave voice and a positive image to the African-American population and was best known for the publication of Ebony and Jet magazines. Ebony magazine launched in 1945 and was formatted to be similar to Life and Look magazines, but focused on inspiring stories of African-Americans and special interest topics. In 1951, the pocket-sized jet was launched, furthering coverage on important and successful African-Americans, music and entertainment, history and politics. Johnson's great success was making his publications profitable by convincing corporate America to advertise in their pages in luring companies, which had never marketed their products to African-Americans before. In the 1980s, Johnson's, Johnson Publishing Company was the nation's largest African-American owned business. The Johnson Publishing Company building was completed in 1971 as the company's new headquarters after residing in four previous locations. In the September 1972 issue of Ebony, the new headquarters was featured in a 40 page spread Located at 820 South Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago, overlooking Grant Park, the magazine stated, quote, the building is the first one built by Blacks in Chicago's bustling downtown. From the outset, Johnson directed that not only must the building be one of pace setter distinction and design, but one filled with all kinds of employee pampering conveniences a building in which Black creativity could blossom and the production of Black magazines would be a joy." Unquote. Designed by African-American architect John Warren Matusame, Matusame was the first African-American to, to attain partner status at a large Chicago architecture firm, the firm of Dubin, Dubin, Black, and Matusame. Matusame studied under Mies van der Rohe at Illinois Institute of technology known here as IIT. And as you can see here, much of his work was in keeping with the Miesian aesthetic. While Johnson wanted a modern building, he did not want the more common glass and steel designs seen over and over throughout Chicago by firms such as Mies van der Rohe and Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. So Matusame employed a strong horizontal design for the facade of the 11 story building, making it a prominent standout on Michigan Avenue. Placement of the columns behind the spans and the absence of ornament still allowed the structure to be clearly expressed. However, the sculptural quality of the front facade is what separates it from the international style. With Matusame, Johnson got a modern building that conveyed strength and independence from its counterparts, and it still stands prominently on Michigan Avenue as the only high-rise office building in downtown Chicago built and designed by an African-American. The Johnson family sold the building in 2010 to Columbia College. It was designated a Chicago landmark in November 2017, for which Landmarks Illinois advocated. In 2018, the building was sold to 3L, the developer who recently completed a very successful con residential conversion. And in this image, you see myself, Bonnie McDonald, and our board chair, Sandra Rand, with the developer. And also in the center, our speaker today, one of our speakers today, Sean, who was fortunately able to join us for the grand opening. Here you see that the grand lobby of the building has been retained as part of the residential conversion and beautifully rehabilitated. However, landmark designation in the city of Chicago does not protect a building's interiors. Next slide. So one thing that also has been nicely done in this interior conversion by the developer uh, for residential use is in some of the public spaces showing photographs like of the former Ebony Test Kitchen, uh, spaces that used to exist in the building, and also displaying covers of past Ebony Magazine issues. 
The redevelopment also retained the building's iconic ebony jet sign and is a great element for people enjoying the rooftop deck amenity. Now, let me tell you about the building's previous interiors that were removed as part of this conversion and give you some context for the test kitchen. While the Johnson Publishing Company headquarters was designed in a modern vocabulary by John Matusame, the building's interiors were designed by Palm Springs-based interior designers, Arthur Elrod and William Reiser of Arthur Elrod Associates. Author Adele Seigelman, whose book Arthur Elrod, Desert Modern Design, has described the firm this way, quote, Arthur Elrod was the most successful interior designer in the Palm Springs area from 1954 to 1974. Elrod's fresh, energizing, and innovative interiors paralleled the rise of desert modern architecture, and he worked alongside the top architects of the day, who included William F. Cody, E. Stuart Williams, Donald Wexler, Buff and Hensman, and most famously, John Lautner. In 1964, William Reiser joined the firm as an associate. Reiser had spent 30 years working with industrial designer Raymond Lowy in New York City, and he brought a more pared down modern aesthetic. He also spearheaded the firm's entry into commercial work under William Reiser Arthur Elrod division, which included the groundbreaking headquarters for the Johnson Publishing Company. Their work was published extensively in Architectural Digest and numerous design magazines. It was probably in a design publication that Mrs. Eunice Johnson had seen their work and she selected the team to design the interiors of her and Mr. Johnson's swanky condominium on North Michigan Avenue. So selecting them to design the interiors for the Johnson Publishing headquarters was also secured around this time. John Johnson is quoted in the Ebony feature on the opening of the headquarters as stating, quote, every floor is different and every floor has surprises, unquote. Here, I'm just going to run through some slides for you to give you a feel for how incredible these interiors were. Many were, of these images were taken by photographers Lee Bay and Barbara Courant, who both had access to the building while Columbia College owned it. Architectural journalist and photographer Lee Bay, who did an extensive piece on the Johnson Publishing Company headquarters in a 2013 blog on WBEZ wrote, quote, behind pioneering black architect John Matusame's four walls were offices designed with an exuberant high style and fearless mix of color, texture, art, contemporary furnishings and pattern. Created by interior designers William Reiser, Arthur Elrod, the offices embodied an Afrocentric modernism that was well-tuned, avant-garde, and quite hip, a perfect match for publisher John H. Johnson's groundbreaking magazines, unquote. So as you can see here, every floor of this building had incredible patterns, colors, modern furnishings, whether you were in a general open office space, next slide, in a private office like this one here that you see that was Mrs. Johnson's all white and cream colored office, next slide, or experiencing just the general halls connecting spaces, always there were these incredible colors and patterns and dynamic areas that you could just enjoy. So now we come to the test kitchen, which is a testament to the aesthetic described by Bay. While some of the building's interior features and art were removed by the Johnson family or transferred to new ownership before the building was sold, the ebony fourth floor test kitchen was left in place. The test kitchen was created to provide a space for the testing of recipes to be published in Ebony Magazine, which we'll hear more about shortly from Sharla Draper. The September 1972 issue stated, quote, the test kitchen is one of the most modern such facilities in the US. It is all electric, has a microwave oven, barbecue, toasters, and can, and can openers built into the walls 
trash compactor, automatic dishwasher, and pot scrubber, and a food preparation center, a space-saving device to which numerous appliances can be connected. The kitchen's continuous design is a fabric laminated in plastic and attached to cabinets and walls, unquote. Here is a Lee Bay photo of the kitchen after the building was vacated by Johnson Publishing Company. The test kitchen is where editors would test meals before adding them to Ebony's monthly feature, a date with a dish. Lee further st stated in his WBEZ blog, quote, this test kitchen alone should make the building qualify for the National Register of Historic Places. Ebony Magazine used to have recipes, and if your mother cooked like mine did, she tried a recipe out of Ebony. So this kitchen has been responsible for millions of meals for millions of Black folks all over the African diaspora. For that alone, it should be preserved, unquote. Some of these photos were taken by photographer Barbara Courant, where she beautifully has captured, again, some of these colors and fabrics and patterns. In addition to the cultural and architectural significance of the test kitchen, the intact nature of the space was even more of a reason to ensure its preservation. The Johnson Publishing Company was an excellent steward of the interiors of the building. As finishes and materials aged or were damaged over time, they were replaced in kind. The original design intent of the kitchen and adjacent seating area were nearly intact. The cabinets, counters, lights, wallpaper, fabrics, and fixtures remained in place as originally installed. Original appliances were in good condition. Only the refrigerator had been replaced, and it was modified with orange front panels to match the appearance of the original. Next slide here, you'll see again how these incredible patterns extend to not only the cabinetry, but over the appliances as well, as you see here with the trash receptacle. And here, uh, one of the great features of this kitchen was the wide open long horizontal window that allowed the food editors such as Sharla and her staff to basically place uh, recipes on dishes that they were testing onto the counter and then others on the other side could then retrieve that food and take it to tables out in the general hallway area. Next slide. So it was Lee Bay who brought the attention of the Ebony Test Kitchen to Landmarks Illinois attention. He had been in touch with the building's new owner, 3L, the developer, who, as I mentioned, was getting ready to convert the building for residential use. And because 3L was interested in assuring that the kitchen was not destroyed and had some other opportunity to be displayed, um, he called me and just really urged Landmarks Illinois to step up and find an opportunity in a way to salvage this important interior. So Landmarks Illinois started negotiating with the developer and coordinating on how to go about this. And so we acquired the kitchen from 3L for $1. And in coordination with the owner, the plan was to document and remove the kitchen in order to find it a new home where it could tell the publishing, the Johnson Publishing Company story. At this point, contractors, as you can see in this image, had moved a majority of the building's interiors on this floor, and the test kitchen was the only thing remaining. A site visit was made to assess the amount of work and tools that it would take to require the dismantling of the kitchen. The contractors on site had about two weeks in their schedule for the kitchen to be removed. Our architect volunteer that Bonnie referenced earlier, Chris Ank, who we've worked with often, had only enough time to really just do a hand sketch to create a floor plan and document the kitchen intact. He labeled, measured, photographed, made this sketch, uh, which in the end became really critical for its reassembly. LI coordinated one night 
and two weekend days for members of our Skyline Council of young professionals, many of whom are architects and in building trades and other volunteers to be able to come together and uh, dismantle the kitchen. Next slide, please. One of the things that uh, is really interesting about the kitchen was also this attached kitchen nook, uh, which was a space that Charlotte told me later uh, where she often held staff meetings. The kitchen consisted of two separate rooms, this kitchen nook and the kitchen itself connected, as you can see the, the uh, refrigerator just off to the right side of the slide here. But one component of this room that really was quite beautiful uh, was a glass window and a glass door. And you can see the Johnson Publishing logo here in front. Next slide. On the left gives you uh, an image of some of this seating area, how it contains shelves and a TV monitor. And on the right, you'll see how our volunteers are now starting to take apart the kitchen. Next slide. And in this image, you can see uh, how it looked as the work began. Next slide. Again, the images here showing you the um, incredible uh, patterns covering the appliances as well as the cabinetry. Next slide. And here, this was really fun. And Chris Ank uh, made this discovery of the original brochure for um, this Foodomatic, which is still on display today, is, as, as you'll see later in the reconstruction of the kitchen. Here, through that long horizontal window, you can see some of our workers uh, taking apart the kitchen. Next slide. And here you can see how many volunteers it actually took to get this job done. And the hood uh, over the stove, as you see in these images, ended up sort of being the beast of the project. That ended up being the heaviest and most complicated component to take down. Next slide. The other thing that was really um, a delicate task, as you can see with our volunteers here, was also um, lifting up some of the sections of wallpaper, um, all the components that were very delicate because they were brittle as they came off from wear and tear over the years. Here's that hood component coming down with several people having to uh, handle it at once. Next slide. Here again, you can see a, a before image on the left and then that slide of what the hood looks like on the right. More images for you uh, demonstrating how the kitchen was starting to look as it's becoming more bare bones. And once all the major components of the kitchen had been removed. Those glass uh, components that I referenced earlier in the kitchen nook, again, one of the most difficult things to remove, extremely heavy and extremely delicate. Um, again, some of our volunteers, while this was extremely hard work, it was a lot of fun. I think all of them will tell you it was an incredible experience. Uh, taking down the very last components here. And again, some really complicated things. Uh, the flooring, which was very brittle, and carpeting, um, all of which MoFAD ended up doing an incredible job of, of conserving or um, recreating. So here is a picture of all of these components of the kitchen um, being loaded onto carts, uh, which then were getting ready to go off to a storage unit. And again, that final image of that window. Next slide. Uh, so this is, for poor Jean, this was probably quite jarring. Uh, what Landmarks Illinois had to do was then to retain a, um, a safe storage space for all of these components uh, that was uh, not only climate controlled, but secure. Um, and while you wouldn't know it, everything fit into this storage space, as you can see here. Next slide including some interesting early um, components like this GE um, uh, 
component from under the sink. Next slide. So one thing that we were extremely fortunate to have happen is um, we were able to put together a really fantastic committee, an advisory committee of people to advise us on how to put together a request for proposals because we really wanted to make sure that the future of this kitchen was going to be that it was publicly accessible. Uh, the, once we put together this request for proposal, really mandating that the kitchen needed to be um, conserved and then um, put on display in a way for the public to see and learn about the history of Ebony Magazine and the Johnson Publishing Company, the New York Times picked it up for us and uh, published an article about the request for proposals and the salvage of the kitchen. And you can see the article here. Next slide. So the, as fate would have it, uh, it was indeed some folks in New York who then saw that New York Times article and contacted the curatorial staff knowing about the exhibit that they were planning at MOFAD on the history of African-American cuisine. And it was incredible uh, fate, the timing uh, from the standpoint of organizing this exhibition that they were able to pivot and really um, make a bid for this kitchen with us and incorporate it into the planning of their exhibition. And as you can see, the exhibition had its um, soft opening last week. I was honored to attend that opening. Here's some images um, from the ribbon cutting at the Africa Center, Dr. Harris making some remarks. And on the right, you see some of the panels as you enter the kitchen area here. And this is a great honor for me to have been able to be in this kitchen for many hours with Sharla. We had a great time talking to people, talking to reporters, and Jean uh, being with us as being one of the earliest curators involved in this effort. And as you can see, the kitchen looks fantastic now in its uh, newly conserved state. Next slide. And here's uh, some images that Jean uh, has supplied for us on what it took to start putting this thing back together. So Jean and Sharla, thank you so much again for joining us today. It's so exciting to have you with us. Um, Jean, I just wanna dive right in with these images up on the screen and have you tell us sort of your reaction from seeing all that stuff in the storage unit when you first opened it up and you had your helpers there and you were literally about to uh, drive it all back to New York City in a U-Haul. And then here, this image showing it coming back together and you're really responsible for this. Can you give us some thoughts on this? It was really wild to step into this space. Um, you know, it's in part of this big open floored construction area and, you know, just to kind of see the big jigsaw puzzle coming together and see you know, all the panels there on the lower cabinetry and the appliances coming together and, you know, seeing a big unified kind of presentation, seeing the range and the hood come together and the kitchen really starting to take shape was incredibly exciting, especially after all the efforts, you know, that we're going through not only on behalf of your guys' staff and volunteers, but also us in getting it here and getting it up, you know, up these eight floors with the staff to, to the space and putting it all together was really a really awesome experience. And John, can you remind us how you found out about the availability of the test kitchen once the article appeared in the New York Times? It was incredibly serendipitous. We happened to be, uh, so we being uh, Peter Kim, the director of the museum at the time, Catherine Pickley, the uh, other cur curator at the time, and then uh, Dr. Jessica Harris, we were on a tour of the National American uh, National American Museum of African American History and Culture uh, down in Washington D.C., and we, a bunch of people just started texting this to us, and you know, to find out about this on that day while we were getting a tour of this museum was just absolutely unreal. I mean, really fortuitous set of circumstances came together, and it was it was really really exciting. And as soon as we got it that night, we started working on the application, um, and yeah, then you know, we got it, and it was the best. I mean, it was. An incredible pivot, as you mentioned, you know, to start incorporating this into the exhibition because so much had already been planned. But I mean, it was incredibly worth it, and it was awesome to have this incredible piece of uh, culinary history in our possession. So, Frank, could you go to the next slide for us? 
Um, I, I mean, it just looks exquisite and it takes your breath away when you come into the space as part of this exhibition. Help us understand what was the most difficult part of the reassembly. And then also um, just for folks to understand this view that you're seeing right here um, with the three panels uh, underneath the cabinet, the glass cabinet, that is where that open window counter space used to be. And, and you made this um, interesting decision because of space constraints to fill it in and to use panels to do some interpretation. Help us understand how that came about. Yeah, so I mean, it was, uh, you know, after having spoken with Charlotte, Charla, uh, you know, it was such, we, you know, realized how important this, uh, this window pass was and, you know, getting food to, you know, passersby and uh, other Ebony staff who, who were going by. Um, so we wanted to kind of keep a little bit of that essence, you know, without being able to see through it. So we wanted to kind of show some other perspectives of the, the space, you know, the, the Johnson uh, Publishing Company building, and as well as like a little monitor in the middle there with rotating images of uh, different sections of the Ebony magazine. And I believe in the uh, dining area the, where there was a screen too, there was an interview with Charla talking about her experiences. So we tried to keep everything as interactive as possible and, you know, keep, uh, keep everything really engaged. Uh, but the really interesting thing about putting this together, you know, was not only finding uh, interior de decorators, uh, specialists, you know, who could help recreate these patterns uh, and really do it justice and, you know, nail down the right materials and everything. Um, you know, we couldn't get everything exactly right. The floor uh, tiles, as you can see in this picture, were slightly off, but they were the best that we could find uh, since the previous ones were uh, discontinued a long time ago. And very brittle. Uh, yes, incredibly brittle, incredibly uh, brittle. Uh, um, can you go to the next slide, Frank, thanks. Go ahead, John. Yeah, no, and the Ronson Foodmatic, as you see there, was probably the neatest thing for me to discover, uh, you know, to see as a culinary historian, um, was just this incredibly high-tech gadget from the 1970s that, you know, the appliance folds out of the, the countertop there to set countertop space underneath. You had a knife sharpener, coffee grinder, um, a juicer and just, I mean, so many different arrays of attachments. It was really impressive to see. And you pair that with the wall-mounted toaster oven, the two electric ball can openers. I mean, this kitchen was incredibly high-tech for its time and really, really special. Next slide, Frank, please. Uh, and again, uh, the wonderful job you all did of not only reconstructing and conserving the kitchen, but the breakfast nook too. And you made this interesting decision on the shelving, again, to use it as some displays for the exhibit. That's right. So we had, we selected a couple of magazines to just give the space a, a little bit more of a feel, but you can also see on the top shelf, there are three uh, picture frames, as well as uh, some white plastic in the back of the, the middle one there. And those are all original pieces to the kitchen that we wanted to preserve. So original wallpaper from the exterior on uh, both sides of the kitchen, the original wallpaper from the interior, the lighting on the hood that was up around it, and then an original floor tile. And it was really important to kind of keep, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, original history to it, especially as we had to change the um, the aisles a little bit. We made them two feet wider to uh, be more handicap accessible. Um, so we, right. you know, took right. a little bit away from it, but it still kept yeah. the original uh, design intent of the necessary picture. for the public. Yeah. Yes. And um, and here again is a beautiful image of how you all did a wonderful job of conserving that glass window and that glass door, which I know were it was just as hard to put back as it was to uh, take out. And I was very worried about it cracking on the, you know, the U-Haul journey from Chicago to New York City. So I was really <laughs> glad it made it intact. <laughs> and then these uh, hole openings, I can't remember, were those wine bottle, those are just, that's just decorative, I believe. I think it was, it's funny, we think about today about these wine bottle holders, how they're becoming so common. At first, that's what I thought those were when I'd seen them. Yeah, same. I mean, we'll have to ask uh, Sharla when she, yeah. when she comes on, but I mean, they definitely could fit some wine bottles. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide, Frank. Uh, and we want to give credit to the team responsible for reassembling this test kitchen. Fortunately, during the um, soft opening last week, three of the conservators were able to attend from the firm Stand and Build. How did you find this, uh, this firm of young professionals, Jean, who just did an incredible job? And I want to note that this is um, Catherine Piccoli, uh, the chief curator at MOFAD on the far right. 
it was absolutely tremendous to work with uh, Stan and Bill. I mean, they were so eager to take on this unique project. I mean, to, you know, not only be able to put this kitchen back together, but make it modular in such a sense that, you know, after this exhibition, it's able to continue traveling around the country so that other people can experience. So thinking about this as a jigsaw puzzle, you know, I mean, you all took it down. That was an incredible effort. So, you know, to keep taking it down and putting it back together and thinking of how all that works, they were really, really into it. And they're amazing professionals. I mean, they do the windows at Macy's on 34th Street and Saks Fifth Avenue and things like that. So they are really- This is probably a project project like they never had before, I assume. Yeah, exactly, exactly. (laughs) A career highlight. Yes. Next slide, Frank. And Sharla, we're so excited to have you with us. And again, I was so happy to just spend so much time with you in the kitchen last week. We had a lot of fun. Um, Tell us your feelings when you first came back into the kitchen here in the exhibit. When was the last time you had actually been there at the Johnson Publishing Company building? Well, I had not been to the building for for years. I lived out of Chicago um, after I left Johnson Publishing. But when I saw the initial uh, setup for the exhibition two years ago, pre-pandemic, I was very impressed. I All I could say was, wow, <laughs> it was coming together and I could easily see how the important story of the African-American contributions to the nation's table would be told through the exhibition. And if you could go to the next slide, Frank, um, tell us a little bit, Sharla, uh, uh, here's a wonderful picture of you as Ebony's food editor, and you were greatly influenced by uh, your predecessor, uh, Frida DeKnight. Uh, tell us a little bit, because we know she's the one who originally named the column A Date with a Dish. Well, before I uh, answer that question, Lisa, I do want to publicly thank the men and women whose shoulders I stand on in terms of um, helping the Ebony Test Kitchen come to life. Also want to thank the staff at the Vivian Harsh Collection over at the uh, Chicago Public Library, Mm -hmm. as well as MOFAD and Landmarks Illinois in helping to bring this exhibition to life. The, I I joined Ebony from the Craft Kitchens and was very excited to be there. I knew that they had not had an in-house food editor and I am just humbled to have been the first food editor to work in that fabulous kitchen. And you outfitted it. My task when I came on board as the food editor was to equip the kitchen. The kitchen did not have um, kitchen equipment or resource files or any of those things that you need to make the recipes come to life. So that was my first task, was to equip the kitchen and get it up and running as quickly as possible. Frank, could you go to the next slide, please? And, and, and while we know this is not um, you pictured here, Sharla, it's, it's, it's Charlotte who was the food editor after you. Um, this, this image just really shows again, um, I think what a homey kind of environment uh, the, the kitchen was and how people were drawn to it, whether it was staff or visitors. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, as you mentioned, this is Charlotte the food editor who followed me. And it looks to me as if there is a tasting going on to select or narrow down some baked goods for an upcoming uh, food feature. I'm not sure who the gentleman on the left is. We'll have to share this photo with Charlotte and I'm sure she will be able to let us know who that is. And, and again, that window, uh, I think you told me once was, was a, a neat way that employees could peek throughout the day into the kitchen and see what yeah. you were up to and smell the smells and, and be really lured yeah. to the space. During my tenure, I instituted uh, something called 
reader favorite recipe. And each month I would ask the reader to send in their favorite recipe for whether it was fruit cobbler or spare ribs or sweet potato pie. And once the recipes came in, there were hundreds of them, I would narrow them down to the ones that uh, I thought were strongest to consider. I would make up maybe 10 to 15 recipes and select a few, um, maybe six to 10 to share with the employees for tasting. I would put those recipes on the counter and then the employees could come by and fill out a short survey, letting me know what they thought was the best recipe. And that is really how we selected the reader favorite recipe each month. That's a fun story, Sharla. Go to the next slide, Frank, if you would. Um, these are some pictures that uh, Jean in his research uh, found as well. I think from what you told me, Sharla, uh, again, this is Charlotte on the far right, uh, but it, it, this is staff of Ebony yes. Magazine. And again, yes. the, how kind of family friendly it was in, in a place of great joy. Yeah, the staff was always very interested in what was cooking. So <laughs> it was not hard to uh, entice them to come by and share their opinion. That was a that was an employee bonus, I think. Yeah. There. Next slide, Frank. Um, and and here's some shots I took of you last week, Sharla, in the kitchen. And tell us a little bit about some of these appliances and 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 the fun you had of working with them. Well, as you can see on the right hand side is the uh, Ronson Foodomatic, <laughs> and that was a combination blender mixer probably a grinder and the um, different elements of the foodomatic are there in the drawer. The drawer was specially equipped to hold each of those optional equipment pieces in its very own place. There was not, they weren't, they weren't laying down. They had their very own, I guess you'd say display case. And when you needed them, you could just go right in and pull out the blender jar and it would attach to the base of the food matic there on the counter. And uh, some of these um, things were kind of cutting edge for their time, right? So I don't even know if you had any of these things at the craft kitchen per se. I think you were- uh, No, we did not have that at the craft kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was, um, I guess you'd say a step up <laughs> and certainly it was good to be able to work with some of the things that were new and cutting edge because yeah. that helped in terms of thinking proactively about what the reader might be interested in or might purchase for right. home use. Yeah. Can you go to the next slide, Frank? Um, here's another picture we have of Charlotte uh you who followed you uh in the kitchen and what i love about this picture is i love um the image behind her just sort of like things up on a bulletin board like any of us would have in our home kitchen um i mean just tell us briefly about kind of you know you used the kitchen for um testing recipes but i know you used that kitchen nook to have your staff meetings and and it in your office you told me once was even next to it on the other end i mean this really was a wonderful space to work Yes, and you mentioned that bulletin board. I do believe that that is an um, image that shows you into the food editor's office. Okay. The food editor office was adjacent to the kitchen on the east side, and that probably is a bulletin board which may outline some of the things that Charlotte had planned for upcoming issues. Right, right. Uh, next image, Frank. Um, and, and here we just wanted to, again, give everyone this side-by-side -side view. Uh, and John, again, feel, to, feel free to jump in. I mean, again, this is what it looked like on the left before our team disassembled it. And then, then on the right, 
Um, those three panels, if I remember correctly, are, are rotating images, uh, just again, giving history of, uh, of the kitchen and the work at Ebony Magazine. And as a food historian, tell us again, from your perspective, just the incredible role this kitchen played in, in, in terms of the exhibition. I mean, it was, it's so central to the exhibition because this is how for, you know, such a long period of modern American history that the African-American community could find out about recipes, people, stories from the African diaspora all around the world. I mean, in, you know, the work Charlotte did and Charlotte and uh, Frida tonight before her, you know, highlighting uh, farmers, uh, business owners, drink producers, I mean, the whole gamut of everyone in the food world and introducing them to the rest of the American population was seminal, you know, and just showing the representation of these people out there and how they were an intricate part of the American foodways, you know, not only in terms of how we got and still get our food today and how we eat it, but also in terms of the recipe building and how just ingrained African American cuisine is in American food. Yes. Well, I know, oh, go ahead, Sharla. Well, I was just going to add that one of the things that is so important in terms of the role that Ebony played in presenting a diverse, balanced, well-rounded view of African Americans. Un unfortunately, there are stereotypes, and one of the stereotypes with the food was that African Americans own, you know, fried chicken, greens, and sweet potatoes. And uh, that pretty much was the diet. Well, that would have been very boring. <laughs> Ebony brought to life um, on its pages some of the recipes and menus that African Americans were interested in trying. Certainly you had novice cooks and more experienced and very experienced cooks. And one of the things that I would try to do with um, the novice cooks is share information that would help them continue on their road to becoming a stronger cook. Now, one of the things that is showing on the, um, video there in the exhibition is a food page that was for January. And of course, you talk about how popular greens and black eyed peas and uh, ham are during, during that time of year. You know, the greens brought, um, the greens brought money and the black eyed peas brought luck. And even to this day, those are still foods that you'll find in most African-American homes for New Year's Day. Oh, interesting. If you I know, can just add, I think also one of the really interesting things about, uh, you know, the food section was that, Charlotte, what you were able to do was show that, you know, this cuisine is so much more than just soul food, you know, yeah. which I think, you know, was, yeah, was really just a tremendous feat at the time and really a great job at making this cuisine so much more known to, to the rest of the country. Yes, we did things uh, on on vegetables. We, we know how important vegetables are for good health. And uh, we did a page on pasta and breakfast and casseroles, just any number of things that would help people become well-rounded cooks. Charlotte, we had a question in the chat from um, Adele Seidelman, who's the wonderful uh, researcher of, of the work of Arthur Elrod, the interior designer. And she stated that it's her understanding that the kitchen um, was not used right away after it was uh, included in the building in 1971. It took some years until a permanent food editor came in. And I think you were the first, but it had, it was some years. So how do you remember the kitchen was used in that interim period before you were there full time? Well, before I was uh, there as the food editor, I had an opportunity to attend some receptions there that were hosted by Johnson Publishing. And sometimes uh, the kitchen would be used by the catering staff in terms of prep for reception or uh, for the private lunches that Mr. Johnson 
or the advertising team would host. And there was not a full-time in-house food editor until I came on board. And it's my understanding that the food pages were freelanced out. And I can say from my observations, it was very important for them to have someone in-house who really knew food marketing and knew what advertisers were looking for in terms of placing ads in the magazine. Uh, magazines really are paid for by the advertisers, not necessarily the subscriptions. And when I came on board, I helped to strengthen the food pages, making it more attractive to advertisers. And I was able to help the magazine achieve a 50% increase in food advertising within wow. one year. So that was really significant in sharing the African-American story. And what year did you start, Charla, remind us? I started in late 82. So it was really a good decade that the kitchen, yeah. um, uh, before the kitchen had a full-time editor being, uh, you being the first. And I know that you told me a wonderful story about how you really sort of marketed yourself to Mr. Johnson <laughs> and helped convince him that he needed to hire you. And thank goodness he did, because you yes. did. Yes, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I, I put together uh, two copies of the same magazine I sh and was able to show Mr. Johnson how with the first copy that they published, how it could have been much stronger by sharing a mocked up copy that was much brighter, more contemporary, and really communicated the benefits of the vegetables that were on the page. Mr. Johnson took uh, about a year to make the job offer, but I'm <laughs> glad he did. <laughs> and, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, Bonnie. Lisa, I just wanted to let you know, we do have a couple of questions that have come into the Q&A oh, when yeah, you're please. ready. Uh, yeah, if you wanna okay, uh, so you know, I can put them out to you or we can put them to the folks that I think, you know, I think can answer them best. So, there, the one of the first questions is, where is this going after June nineteenth? So, uh, Lisa, Jean, do you want to talk about the plans for the kitchen, and uh, and also maybe Lisa, you could talk about Landmarks Illinois' continued ownership of the test kitchen. Sure, Jean, you go ahead. In terms of, I'm Mark not a hundred percent sure where it's going to be traveling next. I know they are looking to try and get it down to New Orleans, and I believe also Los Angeles. So, hopefully, one of those two cities. Yeah, so as we, um, when we entered into the loan agreement with Museum of Food and Drink, uh, it's, it was a five year loan agreement from the perspective that uh, not only did we want this kitchen to be part of this exhibit as long as possible in New York City uh, at the Africa Center where it is now, but to have that opportunity to move with the exhibit to other locations throughout the country and as Jean mentioned, I know that uh, leadership at MoFAD is, is looking at, um, like he said, hopefully places like New Orleans, Los Angeles, so South, West Coast. Um, of course, we'd all like to see it come back to Chicago. Absolutely. Uh, part of this exhibition. So Sharla, you and I have some work to do uh, with, with talking to some of our um, home-based institutions. Um, and so uh, it, it yet to be understood how long this exhibition will be up and running and its locations, but, it, but certainly um, going through the next couple of years. And then it'll be Landmarks Illinois' responsibility to find the um, final home for the kitchen after the exhibition is completed. Thank you both. Uh, Sharla, I know that Lisa had mentioned that Adele Seigelman was on the, on the call. I just wanted to ensure that uh, that her question was answered about the kitchen being empty for a few years. So I think we've covered that. Yeah, um, okay. I see Charlie Pipel is asking about how the wallpaper was reproduced. So I'd love to hear that from Jean as well. And for everyone to know, Charlie Pipel is uh, the head of the Historic Preservation Division of the of, uh, department, the graduate program in Historic Preservation in uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. 
So I don't know the exact techniques. Uh, I can say that the founder of the museum, Dave Arnold, his wife uh, is an amazing architect here in New York City, and she has a lot of connections uh, in this world. So she introduced us to a uh, interior design firm, but whose name I'm blanking on now, but can get for you all later. Um, and they took a couple of the small swatches we had of the wallpaper, and then I believe two of the doors as well, and we're just able to scan them and figure out all the patterning and reproduce it exactly as it was. Um, and then, yeah, tried to, with the peeled wallpaper patterns, they were able to get an idea of the texture of it and were able to best match it again with the, uh, you know, more contemporary version of that material. Lisa, I think there's a follow-up question we could add to that because there was an earlier question about how much of the wallpaper in the exhibit is original, uh, Jean, and, um, you know, what the original fabric was. And from my recollection of pulling it off, it was really a laminated fabric. It was not paper. So can you verify? Yeah, it was a laminated fabric. That way I would imagine, you know, so it was easier to wipe down and clean if any food spills uh, ended up on the wall. All the uh, wallpaper on the actual walls above the counter is uh, reproduction. Everything below that is the original. Thank you, Jean. And uh, Bonnie, I see that the, uh, Irina has asked a, a, a question that's a little more in depth. I think we covered a little bit of it, but uh, I know we're at one o'clock, um, hoping a few folks can just stay on because her question, which I think Sharla could answer is, um, can you speak about the humans who used this kitchen, the food it produced, uh, the relation between the kitchen and the food presented in the magazine, and how the current exhibit will be able to activate the kitchen beyond display and design? I, I don't know, Jean, do you think there's any programming that's going to take place in the kitchen as part of the exhibit? I don't think any program in the space directly, just because it can only hold so many people, but I believe that there are some programs that are being orchestrated around it, you know, so that before the programming starts, visitors and, you know, participants will be able to walk through and then go sit just outside and be able to listen to a more formal talk about it. Um, but I also don't think there are any plans to get any of the appliances going again, just because at this point, you know, we do want to preserve everything as is and not encourage any, you know, new cooking, scraping of things, uh, fat or acid deposits on things like that, but just help lead, you know, or further progress the deterioration of these kinds of things. Well, and I know for a fact, in order to get that hood uh, reinstalled, you sort of had to take the guts out of it <laughs> to yes, make it more manageable. Did. So yeah, it's not really that, a functioning hood right now. Yeah, that's it. Yes, yeah, that thing was a beast. It was very, yeah. very <laughs> Charla, any closing thoughts on, again, like your the favorite foods that you and your staff produced in this kitchen, or what was the greatest hit with visitors or any celebrities that came into the kitchen while you were there? I know quite a few came visiting the Johnsons from time to time. Well, there were always, uh, you could always run into a celebrity in the building. I know that um, Reverend Jesse Jackson came by when he was running for president. And uh, also I know that um, Billy D. Williams came by when he was in the building. So you never knew who you might run into. Some of my favorite recipes were um, a sweet potato pie that was shared from the reader favorite recipe column. And uh, I do know I was asked about some recipes for this presentation, and I will certainly be glad to share that recipe with um, the powers that be in case people would like to download it at some point. And um, also one of my favorite recipes was a um, stuffed, a cornbread stuffed white fish. Um, mm. We tried to, you know, include a variety of recipes and we did do a feature about the benefits of eating fish, even though when you put stuffing in it, you make it a little bit higher in calorie, but it's still good for you. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Charlotte, you're making us all hungry. Uh, so <laughs> we, um, we did have a question for you. And that is with that pass through uh, where you were putting food through, did it have an acrylic screen or some sort of screen that you, um, you know, that you would cover it while you were cooking? No. It no, was open, most it's entirely the, most open. Often when I was prepping in the kitchen, I generally had my back to the pass through. 
because uh, you you don't want to be distracted and or have a conversation going on. That's how you make mistakes. And we had a very um, a very lean staff. It was a staff of two, myself and my administrative assistant Ava Gardner. And occasionally, when we were doing photography, I could bring in a freelance assistant. But we stayed pretty busy. Well, Lisa, we're getting a lot of love for both the uh, sweet potato pie and cornbread uh, stuffed fish recipes, Charla. Okay. So now we, we definitely right, need to share those. I'll get you those recipes. <laughs> That'll um, be a follow-up bonus for all of our attendees. <laughs> right. Um, there was a quick question. People may be interested in, in this question from Allison Fisher, our partner at AIA Chicago. Lisa, about the um, availability of the photos that we've shown today. Do you know between, uh, you know, Lee Bay's, Barbara Courant's photos, the photos we took of the condition, uh, you know, the exhibit, how many of those are publicly available? Where do people go for those? Yeah, um, I, yeah, I would recommend going to our communications manager, Caitlin McAvoy, and uh, we have the ability to supply pictures with proper photo credits. Um, we do have certain places on our website where you can find pictures too. If you go to our website and in the search uh, uh, bar, just enter Ebony, you'll see the various times over the years that we've done features on the kitchen that have photographs accompanying them as well. I think, Lisa, we had one more question, but you've answered it. I, I believe the hope of coming back to Chicago, there were some ideas about where it could go. You know, of course, we also have to remember our partners at the DuSable Museum of African American History, uh, and we're also hoping to to continue talking with the Smithsonian. But Lisa, do you want to have any? That's I think those are all our questions. So if you have any closing thoughts as well, yeah, I mean, obviously, we would love to see the kitchen um, come back to Chicago as part of this exhibition. If anyone has thoughts on. Uh, any of our local institutions and, and wanting to be part of those conversations, we would welcome it. Charla and I are going to look at, look, work together on that a little bit. Um, and then um, we of course uh, look forward to uh, doing the long range planning of where the kitchen will be ultimately. Um, we uh, have had many, many people say to us, this should be in the African-American Museum at the Smithsonian. If they can have Julia Child's kitchen at the Smithsonian, the Ebony Magazine test kitchen should be at the Smithsonian. So um, whether it's there or whether it's Chicago, we'll yet to see. And uh, we're really excited. It'll be part of the journey. Charla and John, thank you so much for um, joining us. If you either of you have any closing thoughts, we'd welcome it. Well, I just thank want you. to say thank you to Landmarks Illinois for all of your hard work in terms of uh, bringing the Ebony Kitchen back to life. Thank you. Yeah, same, same thing. Thank you for, for the opportunities, you know, to work with you all was great. Thank you for, you know, the opportunity to be on this panel as well. It was great. And Charlotte was terrific working with you throughout this as well. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We really enjoyed having you with us. And Bonnie, I think you were just gonna note that uh, we couldn't do what we do without our uh, corporate sponsors here. So if you know folks from any of these companies, please take the uh, opportunity to thank them because it's uh, due to their support that we're able to provide programs like this. Yeah. And again, yeah. John, uh, we wanna make the point that this exhibit is open now officially as of today to the public. Uh, so anyone in New York City between now and June 19th, they should go to the MOFAD website and uh, they can learn everything they need to know about the hours there. That's right. And everybody, please uh, put your support toward our partner, the Museum of Food and Drink. We want to give a pitch for the amazing work that uh, that has been described here. And as I put into the chat also, we hope you'll support our work at Landmarks Illinois. This is one of uh, hundreds of projects that we are have ongoing and the incredible work that Lisa does as well as Quinn Adamowski and our entire staff. So thank you, Lisa, as well for, uh, for your leadership. Thank you. And to the volunteers, because I know some of you were here with us today, Chris Sank, Anthony Rubano, Adele Seigelman. Thank you all for your participation in helping us in this journey.
Thanks, everyone. You're welcome.